Howdy. Howdy. I'm Warren Finch, director of the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum. It's been a wonderful day. I'd like to, like to welcome you to tonight's program featuring two of America's greatest first ladies as we conclude today's conference, America's First Lady, an Enduring Legacy. First Ladies Barbara Bush and Laura Bush, we are so grateful that you are participating in our program tonight. And President Bush, we're thankful that you're here also. In addition to our audience here in the auditorium, we're also being joined by an audience uh, over the internet. This program is being live streamed. So howdy to you all. I'd like to thank our conference chair, Anita McBride. We couldn't have done this without you. This all began when the presidential library directors attended a conference this past spring at American University, which was chaired by Anita. After experiencing that, after experiencing that wonderful conference, my fellow directors here in Texas decided that we should do it here in Texas at the Texas Presidential Libraries. And so we began here today, and we will continue with programming at the George W. Bush Library in March of 2012, and conclude with the program at the LBJ Library in November of 2012. Programs like this can't be done without support, and therefore I am very grateful to our program sponsors, Texas A&M University, whoop, American University School of Public Affairs and American University Library, the George Bush Foundation, which always generous to the library. Thank you to the foundation. And I'd also like to thank uh, the White House Historical Association and Stephanie Sale and, James, and Jim Singleton. In addition, I'd also like to thank my staff and the volunteers who have helped contribute to today's success. Introducing our panel, our program and panelists this evening is a great friend of the Bush Library and Museum, Andy Card, Acting Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service. Can we give him a whoop? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Card was appointed in July of 2011. He's for formerly Dean Card served as Chief of Staff to George W. Bush from 2000 to 2006. During the Bush administration, he was Assistant to the President, Deputy Chief of Staff, and the 11th Secretary of Transportation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Warren. I'll give you a Boston-accented howdy. howdy. It's great to see you, and it is a spectacular program tonight, and we appreciate Warren Finch welcoming us all here. Yes, I'm the acting dean of the Bush School, and the Bush School at Texas A&M is a graduate school, and we're turning out the finest and the best graduates that go into public service, and we're so proud of the quality of the students and the performance of the graduates, because they've earned a great reputation for that school. But I'm not here to, tonight to talk about the Bush School. I am here tonight to pay praise to President Bush, and I appreciate him uh, bringing his library and museum and creating the school here at Texas A&M. But this is really a pretty special program. On November 11th, 267 years ago, there was a woman born who had a pretty great legacy for this country. And I'm not talking about Barbara Bush. <laughs> Her name was Abigail Smith Adams. And she was the first woman to have been married to a president and was the father of a president. I mean, the mother of a president. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. It was actually the Secret Service that whispered first. <laughs> On February 12th, Interestingly, 11-11 and 2-12 are pretty significant days in American history. But on February 12, 1775, there was another woman born, but she was born in London. And she was the daughter-in-law to a president, 
and the wife of a president. The two women that we will hear from tonight are even more unique than those two individuals because one is not only the mother of a president and the wife of a president, she also got to witness both of them taking an oath of office to be president. The other woman is the daughter-in-law of a president and the wife of a president. And she got to witness both of them taking the oath of office to be president. These two women are pretty remarkable. Barbara Pierce Bush has had a long legacy of caring about people and inviting people to make a difference. She cares deeply about her family and she's got quite a terrific family with lots of grandchildren and one great grandchild and she cares so deeply about them but she also introduced us to points of light and to the opportunity that comes with literacy and reading. She taught us what it means to be a volunteer and to make a difference in fighting cancer, helping people. And then you have Laura Welch Bush, a teacher, a librarian, passionate about reading, passionate about making sure that we were all literate enough to read, opening doors around the world for women to make a difference. The Afghan Women's Council, she went to Afghanistan and she helped invite women into being part of that community, a community that celebrated an opportunity to vote, but more importantly even, they're making a difference in the economy of Afghanistan. She's helped to fight malaria and AIDS in Africa. She's inspired women leaders all around the world to make a difference. Both of these women are pretty remarkable, but the uniqueness that they have is even more remarkable. They did watch a husband, a father-in-law, a son, and a husband take an oath of office. It comes right from our Constitution. It's Article 2, and it's the shortest oath taken by anyone who serves in government. And it calls for them to preserve, protect, and defend. These women also witnessed Lots of young people take an oath. It's a longer oath. And this oath calls for them to follow the command of the commander in chief. Both the presidents that took that oath had to ask for young men and women to make sacrifices that they would never invite on anybody. And those sacrifices resulted in a lot of pain. But there was another oath that was taken. And this was an oath taken by these women. It's an oath that calls for them to have a special relationship with a special person. It calls for them to say that they will be there in sickness and in health, in good times and bad times, for richer, for poorer, and to love and to cherish. Being president is an unbelievably lonely job. And it's lonely in part because of the oath that is taken. I can honestly say the two presidents that I served were never completely alone because they had first ladies who took their oath very very seriously. So would you help to welcome Barbara Pierce Bush and Laura Welch Bush to share their experiences first ladies.
to help us understand the, the dialogue of responsibility and the awesomeness of their responsibilities for presidents and inspiration to all of us, Richard Norton Smith, who is a renowned historian, a great author, who really does understand the workings of government from a historical perspective. Uh, Richard Norton Smith has been a friend of mine for a very long time. He helped me with a very uh, forgettable campaign for governor of Massachusetts, <laughs> but the speech that he helped to write was memorable. <laughs> so we're glad to have Richard Norton Smith here as the moderator of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. I don't know about you, Mrs. Bush, I'm not accustomed to getting a standing ovation <laughs> um, just for showing up. You just got it because Laura was here. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to know where to begin. Let me ask, we, we've heard from a number of folks earlier today, and I know you were here for, for the discussion, we heard from real life practitioners, people who have been in White Houses of both parties uh, in uh, different periods of our history, uh, who have been challenged and risen to the challenge. Each of you had in some ways unique qualifications or life experience before you came to the White House. Um, and Andy has, has described them. Um, was that a particular advantage to you? Um, and is there any way to fully prepare for the job of First Lady? Shall I start? Sure. Uh, Yes, I was prepared because I lived in Washington with George for years, and he was vice president for eight years. So I could watch uh, some very good president and his wife. And uh, the truth is the White House itself is so well organized that it's pretty hard to make too many mistakes other than just my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, of course, uh, was prepared because I had a mother-in-law oh. who I watched. <laughs> and I would visited the White House. I had an advantage that no other First Lady except Louisa Adams had because I would stayed at the White House a lot with, when President Bush and Barr were, lived there. Um, I'd been to that inauguration when President Bush was sworn in and then uh, came in. I'd been to state dinners and then gone upstairs to sleep in the Queen's bedroom when George and I were invited to events at the White House when they lived there. But really, of course, what I learned from Barr was that it is a home, that it really is a home, uh, where the family lives and where family times happen, where you laugh and you watch football on television and you have wild dinners and uh, funny people, at, um, especially all the Bushes who try to be funny the whole time. <laughs> especially one that I was married to. <laughs> um, you know, so I knew that it really was a home, and I was felt very reassured when I moved in because I knew that it could be a home for Barbara and Jenna, who were freshmen in college, and, and it would be the only home they could come come home to because we, our house was at the ranch, and and when they came home from holidays, they would come to the White House to stay with us. So I had an advantage that very few First Ladies, only Louisa Adams had had. But you were governor's wife and you did that But I also perfectly. had been First Lady of Texas. So you had... But I knew how to do everything, even as First Lady of Texas from Barr. Oh, stop it. I did. <laughs> well, I did. They're really mundane things that you don't think about, but the Christmas card, for instance. Um, I knew we needed to get the artist that was going to do the Christmas card very early in the year. Usually we'd pick the artist by March or April, and they would start working on the art for the Christmas card. And I did that at the governor's mansion just because I knew that was the way they, that Barr had done it at the White House. And, and so when we left the White House, when we um, moved out, we left a big notebook on how to do the Christmas card. <laughs> for the next person because we thought she probably wouldn't have that, wouldn't know like I did because I had Barr to watch. I let the next person just do it their own thing. <laughs> Actually, that does raise a question. because It's become a habit in recent years for outgoing presidents to leave a note in the desk in the Oval Office for their successors. President Bush um, very poignantly uh, wrote to Bill Clinton um, did either of you have a similar? 
we legacy? Did, I didn't. Neither, I no, didn't think to leave to a them. note, but we did give tours, both of us. And visited, visited with them. And what was that like? Easy. <laughs> I mean, we knew yeah. we'd lost. We're a great country, I think, because other countries, when you defeat, like Margaret Thatcher, she was out of her house the next day. I mean, we're a great country. And many of the countries we went to, the leaders were killed after they were put exactly. in jail. <laughs> It when really we, isn't that you're, funny. You're, you're not, not suggesting funny. a connection no. at all. <laughs> or right now in history, you look at Zambia and they're getting a lot of praise because they had a presidential election and the incumbent lost and he left <laughs> and let the new president come in. But we were all in Washington last uh, spring for a tribute to uh, Gampy and uh, the Points of Light Foundation. And I happened, George and I happened to meet that day with the Ethiopian health minister and I was telling him, we're going tonight to this tribute and all the former presidents are gonna be there to, uh, to pay tribute to our father-in-law and to my father-in-law. And he said, you just don't know what that means to the rest of the world. He said, the rest of the world just looks at that and they think it's so great that all the former presidents, no matter what their party or their politics are, come back with each other and pay tribute to each other. And it did remind me that we are very fortunate in our country because of the peaceful transfer of power that we have. You, you mentioned, of course, the White House as home, but it, it plays so many other roles simultaneously. Um, it's, it's a museum, it's a stage, um, it's sometimes a campaign headquarters, it's a war room. Shouldn't be that. <laughs> <laughs> Not for fundraising, anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> You could have left a note about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, President Reagan left George a wonderful note because George saw him throwing acorns out for the squirrels. And he said to President Reagan, gee, sir, you know, better not do that because our Millie chases squirrels and she's, I think she's got a record of maybe 10. <laughs> <laughs> so the president left a note that said to the squirrel, uh, a thing that said, squirrels, beware of dog. <laughs> <laughs> how, how cognizant are you, literally 24 hours a day, of the history that you were living with, that you are making, and are there predecessors, are there other first ladies, either people whom you've known or read about who are particular sources of inspiration? Well, I was very cognizant of the history of the house. I was not so cognizant of making history, really. I mean, you're just living there every day and thing, a million things happen a day when you're at the White House uh, to, you know, every pop problem in the world comes to the desk of the President of the United States. Uh, but I was very aware of the history of it because, I, because you live with the effects of all the people that have lived there before you with their decorating, with their furniture, with uh, their choices that they've made, and, and I knew that. And so when I moved to the White House, I didn't bring any furniture with me. I only brought one chest of drawers that had belonged to uh, President Bush's mother, George's grandmother, just for a sentimental reason, to have a piece of furniture that had belonged to her there. Because I knew there was a warehouse full of uh, wonderful historical furniture that belonged to, to many, many presidents. And it was really very fun and also very interesting. And I learned a lot about the history of those families uh, just by setting rooms up and decorating rooms and choosing pieces of furniture for different rooms. Educated daughter-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Were you part of her education? No. <laughs> no, but I was very happy in the White House, very happy. The, we had grandchildren, it was great, and you could hear them swimming, and you could hear them outside, you could hear them riding bikes, and we were lucky because we had Laura and George very often there, and uh, we had Marvin's children. I never forget little Walker, bright, practically brand new, sleeping in the Lincoln be bedroom, <laughs> little itty bitty thing, but it was just a wonderful, happy time for me, I'm, I'm not half as cerebral as Laura is, but I'm well, as nice. 
But when, for us, for Barbara and Jenna, they also got to be there as children, uh, as, you know, as the grandchildren of the president. So when they showed Sasha and Malia around the White House, they could show them all the things that seven-year-olds would want to do because they knew it from having been there when their grandfather was president. Like the really high bed that uh, the ushers put a step out uh, for the bed if someone's staying in that room, but um, if there's not, if no one's staying in that room, the step isn't there. And so Barbara and Jenna showed the uh, little Obama girls how to make a running dash and jump <laughs> on the bed. Exactly. Or the solarium ramp that uh, has a wooden floor that every little kid that comes to the White House finally learns to slide down on their Back. seat. <laughs> and Barbara and Jenna, who were, you know, not little kids, when they showed the little Obama girls around, did show them how to do that. <laughs> Pretty cute. You mentioned the solarium. What is it about the solarium that every White House family seems to fall in love with? I think it's sort of the den up there. You know, it's the most casual of all the rooms. They and it's sort of up uh, somewhere. I read about, I think, Mrs. Coolidge, who said, was it Mrs. Coolidge who Her said? Her sky parlor. Yeah, who it. said, it? when I'm in the solarium, parlor. don't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think it was a... Uh, more of a family place, and, mm -hmm. and the children could order their dinner up unless I stopped them. <laughs> but, uh, that is what, when the day that we, or the first couple of days that we all stayed in the White House, the whole family after uh, President Bush was inaugurated, uh, we had a very fancy dinner in the dining room upstairs, and everyone <laughs> was there except for Barbara and Jenna. And we found out where they were when we heard from an usher that they'd call from the bowling alley and ask for dinner to be brought to them in the bowling alley. <laughs> and what their happened? mother put a, their grandmother put a stop to it. Up. <laughs> Ordering dinner, imagine. <laughs> did did each of, did you have a favorite room in the White House? I love the West Sitting Hall with that big window just to mm -hmm. sit in. I'm sure you did too. Palladium the, window. Yeah, with mm -hmm. the in the late mm -hmm. afternoon with the West Sun coming in and the winter. It's very cozy and pretty. I loved the whole White House. And then Laura redid and brought the Lincoln bedroom back to the way it was from pictures and she did a lot of research and raised the money so it wasn't done by the government. And you did a wonderful job. Well, the White job. House Historical Association, who are one of the sponsors uh, tonight, today of this conference, also are the private uh, philanthropic arm that raised money that can uh, purchase things for the White House. Was there a moment when it dawned on you, really for the first time, dramatically, just how much impact you could have, an action of yours or words of yours in the lives of other people? Well, I, I remember when I was the wife of the vice president, I could say anything. Nobody gave a darn. <laughs> <laughs> and I think George had just become president-elect when I made some, I thought, normal statement and I read it in every single paper and it wasn't something I really wanted to be quoted on but, <laughs> but you learn not to speak quite as frankly sort of <laughs> then you forget it when you get older exactly. <laughs> well I knew I knew Lady Bird Johnson who also is somebody that I liked a lot another Texas first lady and of course I knew her because we she was still alive in Austin when uh, George was governor and we lived there. In fact, we hosted the opening luncheon of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center at the governor's mansion uh, before the gala that night for the opening of it. Uh, but I remembered that she said the first lady has a podium and she said, I'm going to use it. But yeah, somehow that didn't really, you know, I didn't really, I knew that intellectually, but I think I didn't really know it until I made the president's radio address to talk about the treatment of women and children by the Taliban. And right after that, I was in Austin with Jenna and we went to a department store and the women who sold cosmetics at the department store came up and said, thank you so much for speaking for the women in Afghanistan. And then I really realized that people had actually heard me and that it meant something, that they were glad that an American First Lady was speaking out for our Afghan sisters. Oh. 
a different kind of outspokenness. You were once quoted in the Ooh. Ladies Home Journal oh. as saying, there's a myth out there that I don't dress well. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, actually, I dress very well, I just don't look so good. <laughs> When, now I'll tell you a nice story. <laughs> we read over and over again, and it was true, dowdy, you know, all those nice things. So when George got elected president, when he was uh, president-elect, he said, you take yourself to New York and you go buy clothes from designers, which I did do. He paid for every single one of them for four solid, miserable years for it. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knew that I bought designer clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they think that's funny? <laughs> that's <so> funny. <laughs> but Barr's right. There are a lot of myths about first ladies, and there's sort of a stereotype of everyone that you get stereotyped the minute you move in. And, well, I, and that's it. It doesn't matter what you do. That's your, that's your even stereotype. Even before you... you figuratively took the oath of office. I remember uh, at the beginning of the Bush, second Bush presidency, there was this consensus among some in the press, who obviously had never met you, that, that you represented the second coming of Mamie Eisenhower. <laughs> oh. and, and first of all, let's be fair to Mamie Eisenhower. Yeah, I mean, who's that? She, An insult to I mean, me or her? Well, <laughs> insult to you. <laughs> <laughs> I was, actually, that was rhetorical. You could say. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you know, Mamie was as much an icon in the 50s as Jackie was in the 60s. It's just the 50s You're fell out. You're not old of enough to know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Do, but you must, at some level, resent the uh, presumptions, if nothing else, the intrusiveness. Well, uh, not really. I mean, look at all the things they said about George. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, one of the things we knew, and we knew this from when George, my George, uh, decided to run, you know, the, what you know, and I knew this personally because, of course, we'd been the child of children of a president, uh, was that in these jobs, the people who are serving get characterized in a way that they're not. And we know that. And, you know, it's just something you have to accept, I think. I don't think there's really anything you can do about it. You do everything you can. I mean, you have a very strong uh, press office that does everything they can to try to get the word out about what people are really like. And, and they're just always the um, opposition that, and sometimes the opposition is the press <laughs> that, um, you know, what? tries to paint another picture. And because I knew that, it really didn't, bother me that much. You know, an interesting thing I think is, I saw Nancy Reagan do something for arthritis one day and their whole press corps, sorry, got <laughs> you up there, whole press corps was there. We never saw a word about it. But the people who were there from Oshkosh, Wisconsin and other towns, their press wrote about the people, what, the, what they had done and what Nancy had done. So the truth is, the word gets out to Houston, Texas, or wherever you're from, nice things. So you don't really worry about the fact that Washington did not print that Nancy had this wonderful pianist who had arthritis and it was a big deal and he was coming out. And it was, it was that doesn't phase you. You know at home, people know that you're doing your best. What is harder to bear? Criticism, which you believe to be unjust, of a spouse uh, in the Oval Office, or criticism of a child Would in the you Oval Office? Would phrase that differently? Which I know to be unfair, not which I think to be unfair. <laughs> <laughs> um, much harder, the son. Is it? And much, much harder, harder, the father. <laughs> there you are. It is, really. really? Much harder, the son. <laughs> I mean, when you're there, when you live there, you, uh, for one thing, you're not, you don't have time to read all the criticism, but 
uh, when you're watching from outside, it's very, very difficult, I think, to see somebody you love criticized. I never heard one bad word about Laura. I was ready to take them on. <laughs> <laughs> Not one bad word. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> You were, you were both wartime first ladies. That must have, to some degree, redefined the job um, or, or the job that you expected to, to perform when you, when you went into office. How, how did it change your lives? Well, I remember when, uh, when Gampy was president and we lived in Dallas, I can still picture where I was standing uh, in our kitchen watching him announce that troops were uh, going to go in to take Iraq out of um, Kuwait and um, how worried we were and how nervous I was watching that. And then, of course, for us, you no know, we question. had September 11th, which mm -hmm. was such, you know, the real tragedy, really, and, and then the other things sort of fallen on that. I, I think the... Uh, uh, I think George's war, my George's war, they're both my George's, but, <laughs> I, but I think my George's war was easier than George W's because we, the, 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 the missiles went in, they went around corners, they hit the targets, They're, the war was over, once they started it was over very quickly. I honestly think that George H.W. Bush taught the world how to keep the peace by ne negotiating. And I remember sitting at Camp David once when I heard George say, well, Francois, come on, tell you, his French is better than mine, but not much. <laughs> but, uh, and I, it suddenly occurred to me, George was calling every head of state to just check in with them and get sort of get things in. He had his ducks in order. Well, there's an easier world than it is now. 9-11 changed all our lives. So George had a much, Laura had a much more difficult time. And what can you do at times like that to provide support, to provide sustenance, to, to reassure? Stop me? nagging your husband for one <laughs> thing. <laughs> I think just the ritual of daily life, I mean the dinners together, the um, you know, the girls coming home, and I, when I wrote my book, I looked back at my schedule and saw that Barbara and Jenna both came home for their spring breaks uh, right before we went into Iraq. They didn't go off to the beach or something, but they wanted to be with their dad. The other thing I saw looking at the schedule were a lot of our longtime friends, our lifelong friends, George's and mine, from Midland, who were in bars Cub Scout troop when she was the den mother <laughs> also came to the White House. And then a lot of times when uh, times were tough, I know Marvin, our George's brother who lived there, uh, lives in Alexandria, would call and he'd just say, you know, let, I'm going to come over, let's watch them, you know, what get some game that they wanted to watch. And they would just watch a game all afternoon. And I knew there was just sort of this unspoken brotherly comfort for George to have his brother and his sister uh, both live near us in Washington and it really ended up being great emotional support for our eight years to have Marvin there and Daro there. And, and is it possible to have a normal dinner without events of state intruding? Sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, unless there's a war or something. Unless people well, are jumping up going to, in to make phone calls which Andy Card probably remembers some of those dinners. <laughs> you, you also mentioned uh, Camp David. Clearly, uh, that's a place that presidential families cherish. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not only a great place for family, and you can have people come up and advise you and talk to you, and it's private, and it makes a huge difference, and I know that George uh, met his cabinet up there and the vice president and met just had meetings where he could be off the record and really learn things and uh, and he was on the phone a lot <laughs> and it was great I mean I think it was great he, he napped which was good we went to church we built a chapel and then our daughter got married there 
people think we built the chapel for her, but we didn't. <laughs> but um, it was just a great Our place. two families really loved it. In fact, we have a record that will never be broken of <laughs> More 12 guests. Christmases at Camp David. Wow. That's right. For the four years that you all were there and then the eight years that we were there. And she fed us. Do you, do you know this? I bet you don't know this. Every bite a guest eats in the White House or at Camp David, the president pays for. Maybe his wife does. But anyway, it's not something you just go and the White House feeds you. And you but it, you'll get a bill saying uh, Joe Blow was staying. One egg, 18 <laughs> cents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, everything is itemized, and so um, it, it's much cheaper than you all pay or we pay now. But it's everything is paid for. So all the guests that they had and we had, we were delighted to pay for it. Now they took. Laura is an only child. She had two first cousins that I know of, and nothing else. That's we him. have 850,000 relatives, <laughs> all on George's side. And she fed them all. She had all of us. We're now 32 or 3. And uh, we probably weren't quite that many then, but almost. And they fed us every Christmas. Wonderful. But we did love going to Camp David. And it was a great um, relaxation, I think, for the president. Andy and Kathy Card went with us a lot because you may not know this, but somebody from the chief of staff or somebody from the chief of staff's office travels with the president everywhere. So on the weekends when we would go to camp because their kids were grown, they would come to camp and then Kathy would get up early on Sunday mornings and drive off because she was a minister of a Methodist church in, uh, in McLean. So she'd leave then. But it was also a really great way to get to be friends with both the people who worked with you, who traveled with you, and then all of our friends as well would come with us a lot. Of which they have thousands. That was fun. It was, it's a lot of emotional support to have your friends with you. you. You may have actually already answered this question, at least in part, but I was going to say, how cognizant are you in, in the White House of being inside the so-called bubble, this, this kind of unreal world, and, and, and how do you stay connected with the real world friends. outside. I friends. think friends are, mm -hmm. friends are helpful. Well, George always loves to tell the story about taking these guys into the Oval Office, boys that we grew up with, you know, now men, 65-year-old men, <laughs> and saying, and they'd go in the Oval Office and they'd go, God, Bush, I can't believe I'm here. And then they'd look at him. Can't believe you're here. <laughs> 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 well, but friends make a difference. I think friends make a difference. My friend family Andy makes Stewart a difference. Came. It's great to have family there, and the girls always had lots of their friends there. In fact, in the second four years after they had graduated um, in 2004, a lot of their friends moved to Washington and worked in the administration in various spots and that was fun for them and they did as well they worked on the 2004 campaign that's where jenna met her husband let me ask you about someone um who's i think common to both bush white houses and indeed to virtually every white house going back to harry truman um america's spiritual president in some ways billy graham mm -hmm. he played a significant role in your big, life didn't he big and tell us about well billy was great great friend of ours and certainly a great friend george's mother adored him and she she went to the inauguration the first one and then she went back to the white house and in the queen's bedroom billy came back and sat with her and so i mean he was that close a friend and she would tell george i think the happiest day of my life was when billy graham came and sat on the porch in kennebunkport and talk to us. But he came to dinners, and I think you all were there when he came to the dinner, and one of our nephews or cousins, one of George's millions, was <laughs> there at dinner and said to him, well, Dr. Graham, I have a very close friend whose brother died, and he was a very good guy. Why did that happen? And Billy was so sweet, and he gave him a wonderful, loving, answer, which um, 
seemed to satisfy him at the time. <laughs> but it, it's a hard answer, and he was, Billy was so thoughtful to our family, and certainly loved George W. <laughs> and H.W. Faith clearly helps you get through the tough times. Faith yeah. does, for sure. And the churches that we went to, the, um, camp, the chapel that Barr mentioned at Camp David, really was very, um, you know, it's something that I miss. We went there, of course, with the troops that are stationed there, the Navy and Marines that are stationed at Camp David, and their little children. And every year we went to the Christmas pageant with the little kids. And uh, one year, two little shepherd, we made the mistake one year of having the Christmas pageant at eight at night. It was too late. <laughs> and one little pair of shepherd brothers got into a fight with each other where they were <laughs> choking each other on the stage. One's little, um, you know, a baya turned all the way around on his head so his whole face was covered <laughs> while his brother was choking him. But these were, you know, they, the were, they were very <laughs> sweet times and it was sweet to be with those little kids and see them grow up. They, their parents weren't stationed there for long, two years maybe or three years, but uh, later, George, ran, after one of the hurricanes, he was down on the coast and he ran, ran into the little shepherd's father who was a CB and he was down working on the, uh, something to do with the hurricane. And so, you know, those were very meaningful times to go to church at Camp David with the troops that were stationed there. And then we went to St. John's across the street from the White House. Um, the, that was the church we walked to or drove to when we were in town. Um, in Washington. And that minister, Louis Leon, is a Cuban immigrant. He was part of Pedro Pond. His parents put him on a plane by himself. He never saw his dad again because his mother didn't get out for five years and his dad had died before he mm. got out of Cuba. And, and this, I remember on the second anniversary of September 11th, um, we went to a prayer service at St. John that morning and Louis Leon said, you know, P Mr. President, you didn't ask me, but I think the reason they did it is because we're a country where an immigrant can preach to the president. Oh. <laughs> Sweet. You know, we went th to Camp David the last weekend we were in town, uh, and they had a going away ceremony, and we, it, it was so emotional. I mean, it was, it was, I, I'd been very brave. Doro had left town, Marvin left town. They just couldn't stand being there but for the inauguration of our successor. We were very good sports about it, but that was the <laughs> most emotional. All those soldiers and military people and such a tribute to George. But it was really one of the most emotional times, I think, that we ever had. A another scene that is obviously never seen in public, but every four years occurs, or every four or eight years occurs, and that is usually on the morning of Inauguration Day when the outgoing president and his family bids adieu to the permanent White House family. Terrible. Tell, tell us, because <laughs> we've never seen it, and yet I'm told it was particularly emotional for both the Bush families. Well, I was lucky because I got to go back with Laura and George, but I remember rushing around the corner to go hug George and the other ushers who, not ushers. Butlers. Butlers who, we, well, we loved the ushers too, but running around because I hadn't said goodbye to one and, and they were in tears and we were in tears and guess what? Eight years later, <laughs> we were back. <laughs> Well, that was, you know, that was another advantage that made it seem like home to us, and that was because we knew the ushers and the butlers from the four years that we'd visited President Bush and Barbara, and of course, the, you know, they stay, they, they're permanent re um, employees, they're not political appointees, and so there they, we were back, and they were back, and that was really fun to get to be with them. But that was very sad with a lot of crying mm. and a lot of telling people goodbye, and the one gardener, Dale, who always takes care of all the dogs. Uh, the dogs love Dale better than us. That's your dogs. Mine love us better. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Dale even went after the Fords left, went to Colorado when their dog Liberty had puppies. And um, he, he couldn't even come to the goodbye because it was not a goodbye to us, but it was a goodbye to Barney and Miss Beasley <laughs> for him. Well, it was very touching. The, when we opened this library, the Clintons very kindly told all the household help that they could come down to the opening of the library and they had a repeat of the uh, horseshoe tournament. Oh yeah, that's I right. think unfortunately we were beaten again, but <laughs> <laughs> they sent their ringer best players down. <laughs> but that was very sweet of them because they knew how much we loved them and they loved George, so that was nice. Can you remember a, an entertainer who you had to the White House who was particularly memorable? Can't remember his name, but I do remember one entertainer who announced we were going into the state dinner, and you'll be, he'll be glad I can't remember his name, <laughs> but we were going into the state dinner and he wanted to sit next to his girlfriend. Well, that's not the way it works at the White House. You sit next to people that you're not married to or you haven't come with, so you can go home and talk about all these fascinating things you did or met or heard. And this guy announced that he was not going to entertain. Mm -hmm. And we were all down waiting, and Laurie Firestone, our uh, protocol, no, no, what was she? Uh, social secretary. Social secretary, he says, it's terrible. He won't come unless he can sit next to his girl. And we said, well, he can't. It's already, everybody's seated. <laughs> and anyway, he did come. But I think she went down and said to him, we're calling a press conference right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he did, he did entertain, but it was a very scary time. <laughs> <laughs> One of the nights I loved was we had a state dinner for uh, John Kufour from Ghana. And uh, we had the dinner inside, and then we went out to the Rose Garden in the dark with a full moon and had uh, the cast from The Lion King oh. come and sing. And you know, they sort of came out of the dark in those great oh. costumes, and it was really pretty fabulous. You, you see the best and the worst of human nature around such events. I, I recently was proud of a an oral history project, we interviewed all the White House social secretaries. I think there were 14 of them still around. And some things never change. <laughs> People try to change the place settings at the president's table. Did you ever run into that? No, I let the social secretary run. <laughs> <laughs> My social secretary kept me in the dark about a lot of things. Well, I didn't know them until I, two, when I was working on my book, two of the social secretaries uh, came to Dallas and stayed with me for a few days and we had the tape recorder and they told wild stories that I did put in the book but I didn't actually observe these wild stories. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, there was a, a, a foreign potentate who shall remain nameless who was coming and anyway someone wanted very very badly to come to the dinner and they couldn't get an invitation and his wife was of this country's descent and eventually word wafted up to the first lady that the, the lady in question was dying of cancer. Oh. And um, she got invited. And I think she's still with us. Yeah, yeah uh, I she, think so, too. She's, you know, but, uh, people will go to extraordinary lengths. You know, Mrs. Johnson, before Laura became first lady, Mrs. Johnson was my favorite. Yeah. But Mrs. Johnson, when we first got to Congress, and there were 48 or 57 new congressmen that year, and Mrs. Johnson invited everybody up to the family quarters. And she told us that she had never been up there before herself. And so she wanted to be sure, and she remembered George's mother, and who had been, her, their husbands were in the Senate together, and she said, if Mrs. Bush, Dottie Bush ever comes, Please bring her up to the White House, and I'd love to have her. I, I found that extraordinarily generous, that she would get us all upstairs, and she was just a lovely person. And I don't think she got the credit she was due. She's also, she defies the labels, because she is on one hand a traditionalist. Mm -hmm. She obviously cared passionately about making life for her husband better. 
uh, but she cared about making life for everyone better. So she was also an activist. Well, we both are that way, so stop it. <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> I'm suggesting you have a lot in common. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> I did get to show Lady Bird around the White House, though. It, um, Linda brought her in a wheelchair, and by then she'd had a stroke and she couldn't speak anymore, but she still was so expressive the way she always was, where, you know, if she saw the portrait of her husband, she sort of put her arms out like oh. that, or w at the door, the doorman um, was a retired uh, maitre d', had been the maitre d' when the Johnsons lived there, and when Linda brought her up uh, to the south portico and she got in the wheelchair and Mr. German fell into her arms, uh, the maitre d' that had been there when they were there. It was fun to get to see the White House with her, and, and uh, she was still, you know, really could um, let me know which parts of it she liked a lot and which parts she didn't. There's really? an, a, probably <laughs> this is an apocryphal story, but there's a portrait in the White House by Thomas Akins of a little girl named Ruth who um, looks sort of unhappy. And supposedly Lady Bird was giving a tour of the White House and she said, I love this portrait of this unhappy little girl. And a man in the group said, well, she grew up to be my happy wife. <laughs> 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 I think that's a true story. I don't know why I asked her about it, but she couldn't really I think that's me. a true story. <laughs> a couple things before we open this to questions from the audience. I assume Christmas is a magical oh, time. Unbelievable. You know, the same florists came back every single year, and it was like trying to get into the most exclusive club in America. And they came for two weeks. Well, or a week, a full week at A least. full week. But These are volunteer florists from around the country who have come year after year to help decorate the White House. They do the, the big wreaths and they do the... But the, now, Laura says the Christmas card. I know we got there in January, and January, whatever it was, we were there the 20th, maybe the 25th. The florist came up and said, what will the theme, theme be, be for next Christmas. year for Christmas? <laughs> I said, what will the theme be? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they work all year long, the florists, on getting ready for the theme, and whether it's uh, storybook time or um, Santa's, St. Nicholas's, different things. But they work all year long. And then these people come in, and they just really do a wonderful job. And they're fed by the White House chefs, and they have more fun. They and, have a great time. And you cannot literally get in that club unless someone dies off. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I can remember Sam LeBlanc as a little boy, and they had oh, those wonderful White House trees all in the foyer with white lights and snow on them. And they invited the children to come down. They had a big snow fight with all that <laughs> stuff. Oh, Sam LeBlanc was buried. He it. loved it. <laughs> The, what the florist does, you know, really looks at protocol for when she is working on what flowers you're going to use for a state dinner. And uh, there's also another story of the White House, and I don't know who this was, but supposedly the big faux pas of having the flowers at the state dinner be the color of their enemy's <laughs> flag. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about so there are a lot of things you have to pay attention to. The one, one year when George was president, uh, they brought out for the Hispanic, for the Mexicans, uh, adobe, sort of an adobe house dessert, and it was perfectly beautiful. Unfortunately, they had little figures on the side of, of uh, Mexicans taking siestas with the big cowboy hat, which they thought would be very insulting. So therefore, as the, the, the waiters walked out, someone stood and plucked the people off. <laughs> <laughs> There. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> There's a famous story at the, the Ford White House at the height of the bicentennial when Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip were at the guests. And apparently no one had vetted the Marine Band program that evening. And as the President and Her, Her Majesty stepped down onto the dance floor, the Marine Band broke into a lusty rendition of The Lady is a Tramp. <laughs> <laughs> How about, the, how about the story that uh, Ronald Reagan was leading 
This is Mitterrand into the dining room. And she suddenly halted. And he urged her to come on. And then, and then she, no, she wouldn't. And he didn't speak French. And her English wasn't very good or wasn't at all. Finally, she pointed, he was stepping on her dress. <laughs> <laughs> now, he told that story. And then later, uh, our chief of protocol told that story as though it happened to him. But we all know it happened to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wrote it in my book because I did the same thing with the First Lady of um, Poland's dress where I stood on her gown. And You're kidding. Kept, you know, trying to get her to move on. <laughs> <laughs> now that's That's a, it's better not to wear a train to the White House. <laughs> you, you haven't asked this, but I, I, I think the most exciting I, I read where you were going to ask us this, <laughs> but I tried to think. I think the most touching day at the White House was the day Locke Valenza came and George invited all the labor union people in our country, the top ones, because they are the people who really fought for solidarity. And we had been to Poland a lot and, and seen the transition, and it just was so touching. He came. And he didn't speak English, but he said things with tears running down his face, this little guy standing at the podium. And he kept saying, God bless it, God bless it. And he leaned down and kissed the floor. I think that oh, was the most so emotional moment. Mm -hmm. And then we, these were great big people, these labor people. And we had a big reception. And while we were standing in the receiving line with this wonderful man, why someone in, the, in this party leaned against the dining room table <laughs> and it oh. went in the middle. <laughs> and the, everybody at the White House rushed up and they fixed it up. Now that person was never seen again. And the, <laughs> the table was gone for like four months. <laughs> but it was just one of those, it was an extraordinary day, really. Mm -hmm. And it was so right to have the people who fought for them. That's amazing. You, I, I have to ask you, in your memoir, you, Are you looking at her? I'm asking you. Oh. You, told, <laughs> you told a story about, as the wife of the vice president, you were in Tokyo, and you were at a, at a banquet with Emperor Hirohito and, and making uphill conversation. Terrible. Wouldn't answer. Everything was yes, no. I went to your child's school. Yes. <laughs> uh, did your grandchildren go there? No. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a very sweet little man. So finally, I said, sir, we, when we drove in, we saw the old palace. And I, I guess it was so old that it just fell down. And he said, I hate to tell you, you bombed it. That is, that is kind of a conversation killer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what I wrote said? to the man on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have a, uh, can you think of anything like that? Or no? Not Come exactly on. like Speak that. Speak Anything. <laughs> <laughs> Try to think. Be honest. Anything truly awkward? No. Uh, I'm telling you, really. she was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm the sure there's for... something. I just can't think of it right now. <laughs> Come last, on, last, make up something. <laughs> last question: um, If you were advising future first ladies, uh, what would you tell them? Be yourself, and and for heaven's sakes, take advantage of it. You have the best artists, the best everything in the world. I mean, I, I every now and then, George and I say, I can't believe we did that. I can, and you you see the worst too. I mean, we had dinner once with Charlie Cheska and his wife. And, we just couldn't believe that we did all these unbelievable things, mostly good, best artists, best athletes, best people. I don't care who you are, whether you're good or bad, head of state, you had to be the best of something, whether how you got there, I don't know. But certainly George and I had, had uh, advantages that very few others, except for first ladies and presidents have. And you ought to take advantage of it and have a good time and, and do a good thing every day. And the house itself is so unbelievable to live in with 
the history there and the beautiful art and the beautiful flowers. You may not know it, but the White House owns seven Cezannes. Mm -hmm. And since the paint, they determined at one point to have all the paintings on the state floor be American artists, those are all upstairs. They're the ones you live with, including the beautiful Monet as well mm -hmm. that uh, John Kennedy's friends gave to the White House. So you're living with really museum quality art and furniture and... You have clean sheets every, every night. Yeah. <laughs> Change the sheets every day. That is really a luxury. I once said to the head usher, you know, you could change ours every other night if you want. He said, please don't break the tradition. Mm -hmm. That would be terrible. <laughs> I said, well, okay. <laughs> he said, I promise, this is the last. What, tell, tell me about that permanent family, the professionals who make the White House oh, function. They've been there, a lot of them, for a long time. But they're, they never say a word about your successor, or predecessor. And that, I think, is extraordinary. So it makes you very comfortable. So if They're I, very, very discreet. If I throw a shoe at George, nobody's <laughs> going to know it. <laughs> but, I mean, they're really nice, and we love them. Uh, we stay in touch with many of them, and they certainly stay in touch with us. But they're, they, they're nonpartisan, supposedly, and they, they literally never say an ugly word about their... About don't, anybody. Anybody, which is extraordinary. Do, do they, they make life possible? Yeah, in, in I the, mean, they're unbelievable. It's really terrific. The, the whole staff, everybody that works at the White House, you know, they everything they do is to make a life for the president and the family great. And they're all really terrific, very, very professional. I'll tell you a funny story. I really don't like birthdays. I don't mind being 86, nor do I mind being 87 when I am. But I just hate the big to-do because we do all these political things and people who don't even know you sing happy birthday to you. <laughs> I don't give a darn about you, but I mean, I've had some birthdays where I've had six cakes. Well, the White House knows that I really did not like anyone to say anything. And I mean, they were so sweet. I'd come in from playing tennis seven in the morning and the, they would say, how'd you do? Are you great? Well, I came in on my birthday one day and I had lunch alone. Where were you? But anyway, <laughs> I was, I was going to have a very nice dinner. <laughs> but I had lunch alone, and when the, when the dessert came, it was a cake. And I, who cannot sing, it, am smart enough to know it goes, da, 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 do, do. They had <laughs> notes on the cake. Without cake. saying it. Without <laughs> saying it. <laughs> Pretty cute. I mean, they're very thoughtful. <laughs> We have a few minutes for a few questions, I'm trying to keep and I believe short. we've got <laughs> microphones in the aisle. So if you want to form a line uh, behind those, we'll do our best to get Gracious. in. Gracious. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sir? My name is Dan Fonsteel. Back in the 1960s, I was teaching at Wisconsin, and a young man came from western North Dakota to do his master's work with me. His name is Myron Johnsrud. Do you remember Muriel Johnsrud? I think she served several volunteer, uh, served as a volunteer to the first lady for several first ladies. I, I did not remember, but I wasn't there in 1960. No, she, she started back in the 70s and 80s. They were there twice in Washington. Mm -hmm. Muriel Johnsrud. I really don't remember. Okay, that's okay. I can't remember my 17 grandchildren's name. <laughs> Mer Merle. Anyway, we hosted them a couple of weeks ago, oh. and they interacted informally with the faculty in our department, and she was quite, I think her skill was uh, addressing the Christmas cards or something like that. That's a real skill, too. <laughs> there are a lot of volunteers in course. Yeah, I understand. I understand that. People may not know that. But when pressed, she was quite willing to rank all the, I think, from Mrs. Carter on right to the present, uh, first ladies in terms of the cordiality with which they were treated as a volunteer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Don't, don't go any further. <laughs> Ma'am. Hi, my name is 
Cheyenne Life Day, and I would like to know how is life different after um, y'all are at, y'all, um, y'all's husbands are out of the white out of office. Well, I'm going to answer that and let, then let her. People <laughs> treat the former president's wife with such they're so nice. I mean, seriously nice, and. Um, it just is, you have to stop people from saying, well, let me buy you dinner. And George always says, no, no, I don't do that. You can't. People clap when he comes into the room. And life is, is wonderful. Plus, you literally can raise money for charities you're interested in by just showing up. So, I mean, that's very nice. I mean, I've done three or four just this last couple of weeks for children in distress and different groups that really just by showing up. That's nice. We're a great country to former presidents and wives. We sure are. That's great, too. Go on. I mean, we, it's very normal. I mean, we have a very normal life now, like uh, no, no more saisons in the living room. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> <laughs> but it's terrific, too. I mean, I think you know when you're inaugurated that four years later, you move out, and I think there's a certain anticipation really at the end where you start looking at the next part of your life. And, you know, it isn't like you think, oh, I wish I could stay one more day. Uh, so it's pretty nice to be in a normal situation again and go for walks and do the things that, that I didn't do that often when I lived there. Uh, President uh, Carter and President Ford, as some people know, became good friends in later years. And at President Ford's funeral, uh, President Carter was one of the eulogists, and he, he talked about a cartoon in The New Yorker that the two of them got a chuckle over. Uh, and it showed a little boy, and he was, he was sort of pulling on, on his mother's arm and said, Mommy, Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be a former president. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. <laughs> Young man. Uh, howdy, First Ladies. Howdy. Uh, uh, I uh, came here to get some advice uh, about finding my future first lady. <laughs> uh, I uh, currently work Wall Street serving the teachers of Texas. I have ambitions in business and politics, real estate, the whole works. But one area where I find myself struggling is finding like, how much to value a woman's um, political intuition or business intuition rather than just finding a woman that loves a traditional family setting. What advice would you give to a young man when it comes to finding um, the traits of a first lady? <laughs> if we have to tell you. I might add, do you know any? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've got quite a few beautiful grandchildren. But uh, if, if someone has to tell you that this is the person for you, then, then move, they're, not, move they're on. not the person. Move on. <laughs> yeah. Because you'll know. I mean, I took one look at George Bush, and George Bush Jr. literally took one look at Laura, <laughs> and he knew that he, that he was in love with her. I mean, it was... Love he, at first sight. It was. And George Bush, certainly, I couldn't breathe when I was in the room with him. <laughs> I was 16. So that's what you ought to look for. <laughs> Can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stacy Dendinger, and I wanted to know how you guys felt when you found out that the terrorists were trying to attack the White House. Well, which I was at. Terrible. <laughs> you mean on September 11th? Well, that was really, I know, one of your questions that I'd seen before was, what were the best days and what were the worst days in the White House? And, and of course, September 11th was the worst day that, um, and, and really when I thought about all the days at the White House, the bad days were the days when something bad happened in our country. Uh, not when something bad happened to us personally, but uh, when something bad happened to um, people in our country. And certainly that was one of those days that, you know, we'll never forget. But also, when I was thinking about your question, Richard, on the best and the worst, there also on those days, a lot of times when really bad things happen, we saw the very best of the people in the United States. 
I remember right after the next day, actually after September 11th, they set up a blood donation spot in the old executive office building and people literally lined up around the block oh. because they wanted to give something and they could give their blood, uh, something so literal. And uh, so I think that, you know, it was a terrible, terrible day, but also I think we saw the, uh, the, the good of a lot of people, including those firemen and, and other people who went into the buildings. What, what was it like, I, I'll never forget, a year later when you went up to New York and went down into the pit and met with the families. Obviously you would met with families before, but is that the hardest part of the job? I think that's a really hard part, but I think that especially those people who lost people on September 11th, it's, it's hard, it's terrible, but on the other hand, it's there's something kind of inspiring about it. A meeting with uh, families who lost their child or their husband and, or mm -hmm. wife and overseas in Iraq or Afghanistan, usually we ended up being very inspired by those families themselves. Uh, the, uh, there was one family that lost their son on September 11th. He was on the plane that flew into the Pentagon and he was a public health doctor in the public health service. He was really a rising star in public health. And they lived in West Virginia and they didn't know anyone else that had lost anybody on September 11th. A lot of those New Jersey and Connecticut towns um, outside of New York had groups of people that, you know, that they knew, for, maybe they didn't know them before, but they uh, knew each other after they lost somebody on September 11th, but this couple uh, Paul, uh, Sharon Ambrose and her husband Ken wrote me and they said, can we come to the White House because we don't know anyone else that lost somebody on September 11th. Mm. And so they came and the, I had already heard from a really close friend of mine who worked in the, who's an admiral in the public health service. She'd already told me about this young man, Paul Ambrose, and what a loss it was that, because he was such a great public health doctor. And then his parents called and came, and I've met them a lot of times since. Um, uh, they were one of the big uh, contributors to the memorial at, um, at the Pentagon. But my friend, Penny, who told me the story about it, I, I told them when I met them that somebody, a friend of mine, uh, had told me about Paul already. And uh, recently, they've started, the Ambroses have started a scholarship for public health doctors in, in Paul's honor. And they were at the ceremony on, on the, where they were giving the scholarship, and my friend Penny was there. And she said she went up to Sharon and said, I'm Penny. I'm the Penny that told Laura about Paul. And those are really the times that I remember the most. They're the people I remember the most. They're hard, there's no doubt about it. I mean, any tragedy is difficult and any loss is difficult, but there's something about it that is very, very moving to me still. And I think to all Americans, really, when we get to hear the stories. And the other thing is how people want to tell the story. They want you to know about who they lost. They want you to know what they like to do and how they were funny or what their personality was like. And that's both people who died on September 11th and uh, people who've been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's what their families want to tell George and me when we meet them. And were you at the, um, the 10th anniversary, the dedication of yes. the memorial? Mm -hmm. What did you think of the memorial? I think it's really magnificent. Have you seen it? Yeah. The, new, the memorial is this huge hole in the ground, um, and it's a big fountain with water, huge. Uh, it's so huge that you, it's as big as the loss. Uh, there are two of them, actually, where the two twin towers were. And the names of the people who died uh, are in a beautiful bronze that goes around the edge. And there's this sound of water. They look like they're bottomless. Uh, with the water falling off all four sides, the waterfall. And the sound of the water also, I think, is very moving. Uh, I think they're really magnificent monuments. Last question over here. 
Hi, my name is Victoria, and this is Valeria, and um, my dad wanted me to say hi. And our question is... Um, we wanted to ask about, like, how was, uh, were, like, the children of, you know, the president's children, did they, like, go to regular school, or did they go to, you know, like, did they have a tutor? You, you mean in history or Barbara oh, and Jenna? Jenna. No, my um, girls were in college when we start when we moved in. And so they were, Barbara was at Yale and Jenna was at the University of Texas and they just went to um, college like all other kids. And they were very fortunate to have a lot of really good friends because there was a time sort of, especially at the first, when the press would try to call their friends to find out things or to be able to say things about them. And their friends were always very, very supportive of uh, Barbara and Jenna, which I appreciate a lot. And so were their schools and their professors. This has been a remarkable day, uh, capped uh, by, I guess you could, it's obvious we saved the best for last. Oh. I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone, uh, everyone at the Bush School, the Bush Library, uh, Texas A&M, uh, the folks at American University who organized the original conference, all of the participants in today's programs, and above all, Anita. Yeah, uh, thank you, Anita. Whose brainstorm this is. And thank you, Richard. Oh, good. And thank you, Danny. So, would you please join me in thanking our guests? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a wonderful day. This concludes our program. Please drive safely home. Thank you very much.